Well, amen. That was good, wasn't it? And it's always, yeah, praise the Lord. It was, it's always great to, to just be able to, to worship the Lord. The, the Bible says we're to worship him in spirit and in truth. And, and there's just something about singing and praising him in song where his spirit bears witness with our spirit. And, you know, we're not, um, you know, we're not about, about emotions around here. We're about the Bible. Um, but, I, you know, if, if that doesn't grip you at some level, even on an emotional level, you know, I, I think there's, there's maybe something wrong uh, in the worship. I think God wants, to, um, God wants to connect with us on all levels. And, and so it's great to be able to, to do that uh, with him this morning. So welcome again uh, to First Baptist Church. Thank you for being here today on this Easter Sunday. And of, of course, Easter is, is a day that, that we set aside as a church, you know, really across nearly all denominations. Uh, and even as a culture, to a certain extent, to, to specifically celebrate the work of God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. People like to deny, we'll talk about that a little bit this morning, but people like to deny Christ uh, in their life, and yet, you know, our calendar is based around his life and, and you know, some of the major holidays that, that we that we celebrate in our culture are based around his birth and his resurrection and those sorts of things. And, and as we think about the resurrection this morning, I, I want to remind you of a portion of scripture in the 10th chapter of Romans. It's not our main text today, but it, it is where I want to start. Because in the 10th chapter of Romans, Paul lays out the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the way of salvation, the only way to be delivered from sin and death and the judgment of hell. And Paul says in verse 8 of Romans chapter 10, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And in those verses we see that Paul is preaching a message about faith about believing something in order to receive something, believing something in order to receive salvation. And what is it that we need to believe? What does our faith need to reside in? Well, he explains it in verse 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's a very straightforward statement. The message of faith is that we need to believe in Jesus, and specifically in Jesus as Lord and that he was resurrected. That is how the Bible says that we are saved, saved from sin, saved from judgment, saved from eternal damnation. And I start here this morning because it shows us the extreme importance and utmost significance of the resurrection. Because listen, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, I think it's a it's a pretty small step from there to confess him as Lord. Because only the one who is life can conquer death. That means there is nothing more important in your life than believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you might be thinking, well, okay, but what about his death on the cross? Well, yeah, of course. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was for our sin, and, and without him paying our sin debt, we cannot be saved. But listen, believing in the resurrection assumes the death of Christ. You can't be resurrected if you didn't die. So it is essential to salvation to believe not only that he died and paid for the penalty of our sin, but that he rose again. And that resurrection was the Father validating his sacrifice for our sins. This is what we know as the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's laid out specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Which says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You see, the resurrection is, is an essential part of the gospel. And like I said a second ago, it proves that Christ's sacrifice and his death was accepted. 
by the Father. And because of the essentialness and importance of the resurrection to our salvation, it's always been under attack by the enemy of our souls. Throughout church history, it's been denied. Even from, you know, when it happened. If you, if you look in the 28th chapter of the, of the book of Matthew, it, it talks about how when Jesus was resurrected, the, there was a problem. The, the Roman soldiers had to, had to go, you know, talk to the council and, and say, we don't know what happened. And they, they paid them off to say, just, we'll, we'll give you money if you'll just say the disciples came and, and stole them at night, that you guys fell asleep. So from the very beginning, the resurrection of Jesus Christ has been denied and attacks on the validity of the resurrection go on to this day. And there's always just been attempts at explaining it away, and, and while they have all been soundly refuted, some people do still doubt. I mean, even, even with that, the, you know, the, the best explanation, if you want to be a, a naysayer, the best explanation is, is what, what they did in Matthew 28 to, to say the disciples stole the body. You know, the only problem with that is all of those disciples died for him. And if they knew it wasn't true, boy, that's, that's going to, 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 you know, some extreme in there to keep that lie afloat. And so they've all been refuted. But there are those that doubt, and the shame of it is, is when the enemy is successful in your mind and gets you to doubt the resurrection, he steals from you the very significance and importance of what the resurrection is meant to be in your life. So for a non-believer, he steals eternal life. And in doing so, he seals your eternity separated from God. But listen, he could even steal from a believer. Now for the believer, eternal life is secure. He cannot steal that from us, but he can steal the hope that we are to get from the resurrection. It's the very thing that God designed to help get us through this life. It's the hope of eternal life. Because if Jesus rose again, then we too have a promise of resurrection in him. John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? I think that's the question on the table this morning. Believest thou this? Romans chapter 6 and verse 5 says, For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Paul says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And that right there is the answer. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the answer to the ails of this life. And what a great hope it is that this life isn't all there is. And praise the Lord, because if it, if it was, then we would have some reason for despair and be of, you know, all men most miserable. But that's, it's not. This isn't it. We have the promise, the assurity of resurrection to the life to come. And that is hope. That is great hope. And God designed for that hope to bring us joy and peace in this life. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, the Bible says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And yet it seems like the one thing missing in our society today is that. It's hope. And the joy and the peace that is to come with it that comes through believing. And instead, we, say, we see anxiety at an all-time high. Even in our teenagers and, and younger ones than that, it is rampant in our society today. In stark contrast to the hope and the peace and the joy that God promises us. Depression is known as the common cold of mental illness. Over 45 million people in our country currently are, are diagnosed with depression. And that doesn't include any that haven't, you know, haven't, doesn't, that don't have an official diagnosis. 
And I want to submit to you this morning that the root of all this is an empty heart and a lack of understanding and or belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And again, this even applies to believers who have forgotten some things that they maybe shouldn't have forgotten. That they were bought with a price and therefore bought out of the anxiety and despair and disappointment that our enemy tries to throw at us. You see, we are not designed to, to try and navigate this life just the best we know how. No, we have a leader who loves us and is there for us and gives us a path and a manual to follow. And of course, that, that doesn't mean that life will be easy. It doesn't mean that everything will go your way. It won't. I think we all know that. Sadness and difficulties are part of the sin-stained world that we live in. But let me, let me tell you what it does mean. It means that even in the midst of those tough times, hope and joy and peace are still available. And that you do not have to be defeated. And that right there is the message of the resurrection. And one that I think we all need to hear this morning, that true hope is available. And I want to explore that hope, and in the process hopefully eliminate any doubts you might have about the resurrection this morning. And I want to do that out of the book of 1 Peter. We're going to study the, very quickly the first nine verses of the first chapter of the book of 1 Peter. So I'm going to read that. So if you just follow along with me, we'll have all of them. Feel free to open in your Bible. We'll have all of them up on the screen as well. We'll look at the first nine verses. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God and Father through sanctification of the Spirit and to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith and a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. And the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with, unspeakable, with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of our souls. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to just come meet with us this morning and, and teach us from his word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the time we have together. Thank you for this day that we set aside to, to celebrate the, the most important event in the history of this world. And, 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 and as you rose again, uh, after you took our sin upon you on the cross, and Lord, we're just so thankful for that. And, and Lord, I just pray for everybody here this morning that, that they will hear directly from you. They won't hear from me, but they'll hear from you. They'll hear from your word this morning, that you'll speak clearly to their hearts and that you'll give them what it is that they need and understand the hope that we have through the resurrection of your son. And Lord, we just love you. We thank you for the time we have together and we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Now in this passage, Paul describes what he calls a lively hope that we should receive from believing in the resurrection. We read that in verse 3, and I, and I use that just as our title this morning, A Lively Hope of the Resurrection. And just in case you're wondering, lively hope, very simply, just means a hope that is alive, that is real, and that brings about life in you to the point that it changes your very being and even the way you live. And I want to give you three characteristics of this hope that we see in this passage that is good news for all of us. And the first characteristic I want you to see is that lively hope is available to strangers. Lively hope is available to strangers, and this comes as the best of news, because strangers are what we all were at one time and what some of you might still be today. And, and I'm not talking about those of you who are visiting with us for the first time. You know, maybe you feel like a stranger, and in one sense, maybe you maybe are a stranger to most of us. But my, my desire is that you feel at home here today. And, and just know that you're welcome anytime. We're thrilled that you joined us this morning. But that's not what I'm talking about. 
What I'm talking about is a spiritual distinction. Let me show you what I mean in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, Peter writes this book and this section of Scripture regarding the hope of the resurrection to a group of people he calls strangers. And a stranger just means an alien. And historically, the historical application of this verse is it was those Jewish Christians that were scattered or dispersed away and out of Judea. You know, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and after the, 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 the blossoming and blooming of the church at the beginning of the book of Acts, that's, that's where we're at in our normal Sunday morning study, so we've seen some of this. We saw that after that church got go, going, they began to face great persecution. We saw that at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, primarily. And so the first century was a time of great dispersion, known as the time of dispersion. And those those Jewish believers were scattered abroad and dispersed among many of the regions of the civilized world at that time as they were running from the persecution that they were facing. And so what the Bible says is that they were strangers in the lands in which they landed. And the word stranger is used many times in Scripture. One example is Exodus 22, verse 21. God tells his people, Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. And God's people were not strangers unto themselves, but they were to the people of Egypt, just like they were to those regions in which they were dispersed. But on the flip side, what we see in Scripture is that to Israel, the strangers were the Gentiles. And that's kind of the historical context of of what's being talked about here. But spiritually speaking, that is us. You see, before our salvation, we were strangers to the household, to the kingdom of God. Paul explains it in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. He says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And then jump down to verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And what you need to see in in these verses is that a stranger to the household of God has no hope. They're without Christ. That's what Paul says in verse 12 of of Ephesians chapter 2. That is the end of those without Christ. But the message doesn't stop there because he goes on to say that we've been made nigh by the blood of Christ. We've been brought close to God through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. And that means that hope is available to the stranger. Hope is available to you and me. Now, it's not automatic because Christ's blood isn't automatically applied to the sinner. But it is available. And when we accept Christ's offer of salvation by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and placing our faith in the Lord Jesus and then enter in to the family of, and household of God, we are no more strangers. And that's good news. <laughs> so the word gospel means, it means good news. That right there, what I just told you, is, is the best of news. And many in this room can attest to that truth this morning. There are many of us who were strangers and were cut off from him, but now we are children of God. He took our sin upon himself on the cross of Calvary. And there was a time in our life when we trusted in him to pay our sin debt, and we believed in the death, burial, and in the resurrection. And in that moment, hope was restored. Because for me, I can't tell you how much joy it brings me to not only be the son of Gene Stogsdale. I mean, I'm proud to be the son of Gene Stogsdale. He's a great man and a great father. But I not only have a physical birthday, I have a spiritual birthday as well. Because I have been born again. And I've been adopted by God the Father. 
by the creator himself, and I am a son of God. And I pray that I never get over the wonder of that truth. But listen to me very carefully, because if you're in here this morning and you still are a stranger to God and lacking hope, I want you to know that you don't have to stay that way. Because secondly, our second point this morning is that lively hope is found in our salvation. Lively hope is found in our salvation. Look at verse 2. He said, elect, according to speaking of these strangers who are, who, who, who are now who are believers in, in Jesus, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And what we see in, in those verses are just a beautiful description of what happens when we place our faith in Jesus Christ and are saved. And in this salvation, Peter talks about the exact same things that Paul does throughout his epistles. How a believer in Jesus has been chosen and begotten and born into God's family and then blessed beyond measure because of it. We are born again unto a lively hope. And listen to me, at the moment that you chose Jesus, your life changed in a miraculous and monumental way. And don't get tripped up by the word elect that you see there in verse 2. It just means that God chose us according to his foreknowledge. That's what it says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. You see, God is eternal, and he exists outside of space and time. So he has knowledge about what happens in space and time before space and time ever even existed. I know, like, think about that for a little bit. Like, that'll break your brain. I know it. But because of this, because of, of what the Bible calls his foreknowledge, God knows who will ultimately choose Jesus and who won't. God saw all of that before he ever spoke creation into existence. And because he saw you choose Jesus, he chose you. And it selected you to become one of the elect. So people argue, how can God be sovereign and still allow a free will in man? Foreknowledge. That's how. It's not that hard. And just think about that for a minute and how amazing it is that before the foundation of the world, God saw you. And he saw me. And that, that, that's just incredible to me, and it's something I can't wrap my head around. It's an amazing truth. He saw us even before the foundation of the world. But the real question is, did he and does he see you in his family or not? Because that's up to you. What's even more amazing to me in verse 2 is that, that we see the entire trinity involved in the salvation of man. And, and, and there's just so many beautiful pictures in that. And God created us, originally created Adam in his image and likeness. And Adam messed all that up but in, in his sin. But we were created as God, and God is three in one. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And we too are three in one because we have a body, and we have a soul, and we have a spirit. And, and, and uh, the, the, in our creation... God designed it that way. And then as we are new creatures in Christ, the Trinity is again involved even in our salvation. And we see that so beautifully here in verse 2. Look at it one more time. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. We see the Trinity involved in the process of a new birth. So in that verse, we see that the Father selects or based on his foreknowledge and, and brings you into the elect. The Father selects, and then the, the Spirit sanctifies, and all sanctifies means is to set apart. Now, the, the Spirit sets you apart. Part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to seal us. 
And that sealing when we get saved separates us from the world and from our flesh. And through his indwelling, he joins us to the Godhead. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. We've been all made to drink into one spirit. So the Father selects, the Spirit sanctifies, but then third, we see that the Son saves. The Son saves. And how does he do that, according to 1 Peter 1, verse 2? By the sprinkling of his blood, by his sacrifice on the cross, his blood was shed to wash away our sin. Revelation 1, 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You see, there was a time where I was a sinner. Because of that, I was separated from God as a stranger. As were you and every person that has walked this planet throughout history. But because of our sin... God knew we were separated from him, so he made a way. He made a way for us to get to him. He's not willing that any should perish, the Bible says. And the way is Jesus. Jesus even said so himself, John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. See, God the Son became a man in Jesus, and he lived a life that you and I could not live, one that was sinless. And therefore, he died a death that we could not die as a perfect sacrifice for sin. He had to live the sinless life to be the perfect sacrifice. That's why you and I can't do it. So he took our sin to Calvary. Listen to how Paul describes it in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Those are some of my favorite verses in the Bible. He, he took my sins and he nailed them to the cross and, and the law that was condemning me. He who knew no sin became sin so that I could partake in the righteousness of God through Jesus. What an incredible and good God he is. And all you have to do to receive that salvation offer is believe it. Believe that Jesus died that death for your sins personally and that he rose again three days later in victory over death as Lord of all. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart in truth. And in the moment you do, God trades your life for Jesus' life. There's no better trade. Talk about getting ripped off. Christ for the criminal, man. Romans 5, verses 9 and 10 puts it this way. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so once we believe on Christ as our sin bearer, God's wrath is satisfied. And we are justified before him. It is just as if I had never sinned. And of course I have sinned. Of course we have all sinned. But when we accept that trade offer, the Bible says we are placed in Christ. So Christ is what God sees when he looks at us. Because we are in him. And so when Christ looks at us, or when God looks at us, he sees his son. And in that moment, all of your shame is gone. Do you need that this morning? And listen, maybe you're already a believer, but you need to grasp that truth today. There are so many Christians who, who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and still live under a burden of shame and guilt for a life that they used to live. And if you feel that this morning, listen, listen to me. You're believing the lie of the devil. 
Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, I do have to point out that this verse, this verse does differentiate those who are walking after the Spirit versus those who are walking after the flesh. So if you are a believer, but you're not living the life of Christ, and you're still walking after the flesh and fulfilling the lust of the flesh, then you should be ashamed of that life. And you should get that right. Because you have the Holy Spirit of God inside you and you are no longer a stranger. You're no longer a slave to sin. So live in the victory that God has given you. That is the message of, of certainly Romans chapter 6, but many places throughout the Bible. Get a hold of God's grace and his love for you. The, there is hope that is so much greater. There is grace that is so much greater. Listen, God has seen it all. And he knows it all. So if you're living a life of sin today, stop it. Live in his victory. But listen, if you are living in shame because of your past over the sins that Christ already paid for, you don't have to do that anymore. God's seen it all, and he knows it all. And he saw your lying and your cheating. And he knows about the abortion and the drug use sexual perversion, whatever it was, he knows, and he loves you anyway. And back in 1 Peter chapter 1, at the end of verse 2, Peter describes this for us in very clear terms. Because there we see the result of placing our faith in Jesus Christ and being saved, and the re result is grace and peace that is multiplied. Because you now have a lively hope, is what verse 3 says and an eternal inheritance because you're a child of God, verse 4. An eternal security because your salvation is held by God and not you, verse 5. So there's so much to look forward to. Your eternity is sealed in Christ forever to be with the Lord. But listen, the great thing about our God is that the hope that we have in him isn't only for the life to come. It's not only for eternity. It is for today as well. And so point number three is that lively hope provides immediate satisfaction. That's what it should do for today, for this life. Look at verse six. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations at the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Jesus Christ. There's, there's struggles that we go through, and, and our, our faith, it, it, it goes up against trials. But those trials, they refine us, and they bring us into the honor and glory of him. Verse 8, who having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. What an incredible set of verses. You see, Peter says that even in the midst of heaviness or sadness, even through temptations and trials, the hope of our salvation can still bring us joy unspeakable. It can refine our faith in him and bring us into fellowship with him. And that is because you then get to connect with Jesus on a more intimate level. And he'll be there to take you through it, and Jesus knows exactly how you are feeling. He knows what it feels like to be heavy in sadness. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 37, the night before his crucifixion, in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he knows the feeling of and how to successfully navigate temptations and trials. Matthew 4, 1 says, then, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So listen, when you have Christ in your life, that should bring you joy. And Paul is maybe the greatest example of a Christian who faced heaviness and temptations and yet remain joyful. You see it throughout his letters in the New Testament, but maybe 
most prominently you see it in the book of Philippians. The theme of the book of Philippians is joy. If you wanted to pick a theme for the book of Philippians, it's joy. It's a sub-theme of contentment. And Paul wrote that letter from the end of a chain. Paul was in prison, literally chained, when the Holy Spirit inspired him to write a letter focused on the joy and the contentment that we can have in Christ. It's incredible. And then in the middle of it, in the middle of all his suffering, what was the cry of his heart? To know Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings to be made conformable unto his death, Philippians 3.10. But listen, that is the joy for the believer, to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings, to be like him. Why? Because our life isn't in this flesh. Our life is in him. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And to be with him in the mission, even through suffering, to see a lost world redeemed, I'm telling you, there's nothing better than that. That is as good as it gets. And, and because when we, we have that exchange of life, we're given purpose for the first time in life. You now have something to live for. And it's so much bigger than you. If you're just living for yourself, you'll never find peace. You'll never find satisfaction. You'll never find hope. You need something bigger than you. And God gives it to you in him. And he sets you on a mission. We get to be a part of seeing strangers brought nigh by the blood of Christ. What an amazing thing. You get to be a part of changing the eternal destiny of someone else. It's how good God is. And we waste our time on temporal pursuits in his place. There's no satisfaction in that. If you make this life all about you, you will never have joy or peace or satisfaction. You only get that through the hope that is found in Christ and in truly exchanging your life for his. But when you do that, you have immediate satisfaction and peace and security, even in the hard times that we all face in this life. You can have joy unspeakable. And this hope is not a, a wishful thinking. It is certainty based on God's word. It's, it's, it is an I know it so hope. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not things. But I want to I break that down because substance means assurance realization, something that is tangible and real. And evidence entails proof. So biblical hope rests on solid proof, not just feelings, not just conjecture, not just wishful thinking. And it's all because of Easter. And when you place your faith in the gospel that Christ died and was buried and rose again, that he died to satisfy God's wrath over your sin, that he was buried and placed in the grave for three days to fulfill the prophecies and promises of God, and that he rose again the third day in glorious power. It is through God's grace and your faith in all that I just said that you are born again and have this wonderful and certain lively hope. And that should propel you through the difficulties of this life. That's how much God loves you. And I hope you believe that this morning. And you say, well, I don't, I don't feel the love of God. Well, listen, feeling isn't the issue. The truth is, you don't believe that God loves you. You don't believe what the Word of God says. Because God loves you with all of his heart, and he shed his blood on Calvary to prove it. What else does he need to do? And the proof that his shed blood is enough is the resurrection. Sacrifice accepted. And now maybe some of you are in here have hang-ups about this truth because your family is messed up. And maybe your father or your mother didn't or, or d don't love you like they should. And that makes it hard for you to believe that your heavenly father loves you. 
And maybe that is why your life is all about you. And nobody else has looked out for you, so you're going to look out for yourself. I want you to know this morning that's a hopeless approach. But there is hope. And that hope is because Jesus is alive today. He died, but he didn't stay dead. And that's what today is all about. So don't let this day come and go. If you do not know the hope of the resurrection personally for yourself. I mean, why else would you come to church this morning? I know Easter is a popular time to come to church. We have more people here than we do on a normal Sunday. But listen to me. Coming to church, especially coming to church on Easter Sunday, it does not earn you any favors with God. None. No amount of good works will. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here today. I'm glad that you're here, but I love you the no- enough to tell you the truth. Coming to church today does nothing for you. But giving your life to Christ does. Coming to church today could be the best decision you ever made if you'll give your life to him. God only accepts the sacrifice of his son. So trust in that for eternal life today. And let's have every head bow and every eye closed. And with no one looking around, I, w- I want to ask you a question. Just hearing what you've heard this morning, do you remember and know of a time in your life that you were saved and accepted Christ's sacrifice for your sins as your, as your own, for yourself? Was there a time that you believed and confessed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are saved? And if you were to leave out of here, God forbid, die on your way home, do you know where you would spend eternity? Do you have the lively hope we've talked about this morning, or are you still a stranger to God? And if you don't know, if you don't have answers to those questions, if you are still a stranger, I want to pray for you. So I just want to ask you, no one's looking around, so don't worry about that. But if there's anyone in here this morning who is not sure that you're saved, I just want you to raise your hand. That's all I want you to do. Is there anyone in here who doesn't, if you say, Troy, I'm not sure. I don't know. If you just lift your hand up, I just want to pray for you. I see you up there in the balcony. We have anyone else? Anyone would be bold enough to, I see you right here. Anyone else? I see you. Anyone else would say, Troy, I don't don't know that I know. And I don't have hope. And I need hope today. Anyone else? There there may be some that I missed, but I'm just going to pray. I just want to take a second. I'm going to pray for those that have have raised their hand. And and, and after we pray, uh, um, we're going to sing a song. and 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 I want you to know that my prayer for you won't save you. I want want to be clear about that. Only your prayer, only placing your faith in Jesus will save you. But you can do that this morning. And after I pray, like I said, we're going to sing a song to close out the worship. And if you want to talk to someone about being saved, I want you to come forward during that song. And we're prepared to take the word of God and show you how you can be saved today and get the lively hope of resurrection. We won't give you our opinion. We'll show you through God's word what it means to be saved. And I know that, you know, walking out an aisle can be intimidating. You don't have to do it. You can do it there in your pew, but, but I, I want to be able to just be clear as can be with you, and I think there's something that God honors and recognizes just with the boldness to, to step out and, and put your pride aside and put your fear down. Um, don't let that stuff keep you from being saved today, certainly. So let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the time we've had together, and and Lord, there are those here in this crowd that, that have confessed that, that they don't, they're not sure, Lord, that, that they don't know where they would spend eternity if they were to die today, and that they're still strangers unto you. And Lord, I just pray for them now, and I just thank you for their courage to, to raise their hand this morning, and even those that may, maybe I didn't see, others out there. And, and, and Lord, I just pray that, that your Holy Spirit will continue to work in their hearts and And, Lord, that they'll get saved today, and they'll come down, and they'll talk to us, and we can show them out of your word what it means to be saved. And, and Lord, we would certainly rejoice in all of that. And, and Lord, I pray for the rest of us here that, that, that maybe need, even those of us that are believers, Lord, that just need a hope 
today in you, but it's available. And so, Lord, I pray that, that you work your word in our heart and our life as only you can for your glory and change us into your image. Give us, give us that hope. Bring us a part of something uh, that, that's more meaningful than just living life for ourselves. I thank you for, for doing that, Lord. We love you. We thank you that you did live a life that we couldn't live, and thank you that true to your word and the prophecies in it, you rose again uh, for our salvation. We love you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name.